The rotator cuff muscles are an exceptionally well-known group of muscles to orthopedists because they account for a large share of office visits. These muscles make up some of the major muscles in the shoulder responsible for moving your arm. The four muscles are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, which can be remembered with the memory aid, SIPS. Remember, the little t is for teres minor. To learn these muscles, I suggest that you actually try out the motions yourself and remember them accordingly. Nothing like some muscle memory to help you remember the muscles. Okay, the supraspinatus is most important for abducting the arm about 15 degrees. So, hold your elbow at your side and move it away from your body about 6 inches. And now thank your supraspinatus. After that, the majority of abduction is taken over by the deltoid. People will complain that they can't lift their arm, but if they can get their arm up onto a chair or if they bend over at the waist, they can often continue to lift it without difficulty. The next muscle is the infraspinatus which is responsible for laterally rotating the arm. So, put your elbow at your side again. Rotate your hand away from your body without moving the elbow. Now thank your infraspinatus. This is the most often injured muscle by pitchers. Again, try out the lateral rotation of your arm so that you can remember what the infraspinatus does. All right, next is the teres minor, which adducts and laterally rotates the arm, just like the infraspinatus. And finally, we have the subscapularis, which adducts and medially rotates the arm, which is the exact opposite of the teres minor and infraspinatus. So let's say you're sitting in an audience and clapping your hands with your elbows at your sides. What muscles are you using? The subscapularis will bring your hands together, and the teres minor and infraspinatus will bring them apart. Let's try applying this information to a question. Let's say a 50-year-old man presents to the ED because of severe pain with even slight abduction of his arm following a skiing accident. You diagnose him with a rotator cuff tear. Based on this movement deficit, which muscle tendon do you think was injured? If you said supraspinatus, you're absolutely correct. Which muscle tendon is most commonly injured in a rotator cuff tear? the supraspinatus. Okay, we're not going to spend a ton of time on the wrist bones because it's fairly complicated and relatively low yield, but it's worth at least looking so that you have some frame of reference for certain upper extremity injuries that we'll talk about later on. Specifically, you may want to memorize the mnemonic for the different wrist bones that we have here. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. If you have to commit any of them to memory, definitely memorize the scaphoid, the hamate, and the lunate, because they're involved in some significant common injuries. Okay, one way that the board might test this is to present a patient with pain when pressing on the anatomical snuff box. So what bone did she injure? If you said the scaphoid, you're absolutely right. Do you see the fracture on this x-ray? Fractures of the scaphoid are particularly interesting because the scaphoid receives tenuous retrograde blood supply, and thus is prone to avascular necrosis. Another way the boards may test this is by presenting a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome and then asking, dislocation of which bone may cause these symptoms? Okay, if you said the lunate, then you're right. It can cause median nerve compression. What if you saw a patient with an ulnar nerve injury after a fall on an outstretched hand? That would be a hamate bone injury. All right, let's have a flash quiz. What muscle abducts the arm above 15 degrees? The deltoid. Now we're about to dive into the heart of musculoskeletal anatomy for step one, the upper extremities. Let's start with the anatomy of the brachial plexus, which serves as a good conceptual foundation for understanding the rest of the upper limb. When I look at the diagram of a brachial plexus, it looks like the devil to me, and I think that learning it is definitely hellish. Bear with me here. All right, do you see the horns? Here's one horn. Here's the other horn. 
and here's a nose right here. And as you come down, you've got a very strong jaw and a chin. And here's one eye. And here's the other eye. Maybe this funny little drawing will help you remember where the divisions are for this complicated structure. Let's go through it a little more formally, starting with the nerve roots, which are C5 through T1. Keep in mind that though there are cervical nerves 1 through 8, there are actually only how many cervical vertebrae? That's right, only seven cervical vertebrae. C8 comes out below the C7 vertebra. All of the other cervical nerve roots come out above their vertebrae. All right, let's look at the trunks next. The upper, middle, and lower. After this, you get the divisions, and then the cords, and the branches. The cords are named for their positions relative to the axillary nerve. The posterior cord splits off into the major extensor nerves of the limb, the axillary and the radial nerves, so of course a posterior cord lesion will cause problems with extension. These are part of the last segment, the branches. The others come off the lateral and medial cords and form the musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar branches. As you can see in this schematic, there are five different sets of levels overall in the brachial plexus. You can remember the order of the levels with the acronym Randy Travis Drinks Cold Beer. These next couple of pictures are relatively high yield pictures of the major nerve branches associated with dermatomes for the upper extremity, including the hand. It's worth having a rough idea of where each of the dermatomes lie in your mind because many questions will describe paresthesias and patches of skin and will require you to know which nerve is involved. So I would spend some time looking at the diagrams of the dermatomes on the screen here, which show the cervical roots. As you'll recall from embryology, as the fetus develops, the arms rotate. And as you can see here, the nerve roots seem to twist around the arm, especially as compared with the rest of the body. As a point of reference, I like to use C7. C7 is the key root to using your middle finger. I had an anatomy professor help us remember this by basically flipping us all off and taunting us with C7, ha ha ha, C7. From there, it's pretty easy to remember because the thumbs are C6 and the deltoids are C5, and working the other way around from C7, C8 is in the fourth finger and T1 is on the forearm. So really, it's not so bad. Now that we've got some of the normal anatomy down, let's talk about the high yield lesions of the brachial plexus. While we won't be discussing all of the branches that we just mentioned, we'll go through some of the important ones. As we go through this, try and think about what level, that is root, trunk, division, cord, branch that we're at, and then what the mechanism of injury is, and if it's noted, what the injury causes. Okay, the upper trunk is most commonly injured by trauma, especially direct trauma to the tip of the shoulder, and is called an herb Duchenne palsy, or colloquially as a waiter's tip palsy. The deltoid, biceps, and brachialis muscles are paralyzed. So the arm hangs down, medially rotated as you see here, with no elbow flexion or supination. In contrast to the upper trunk, the lower trunk is not as commonly injured by trauma, though it can be damaged by stretching injuries like trying to grab something while falling or if the baby's arm is pulled upward too aggressively during labor, which is sometimes how you're going to see this on tests. More commonly, it's injured by compression. Compression can be from a variety of things, usually something exotic. A classic board example would be a pancose tumor of the lung, that is, a superior sulcus lung cancer, which you'll see discussed in more depth in the respiratory chapter, or a cervical rib, which is quite literally an additional rib attached to the cervical vertebra. Both upper and lower trunk injuries cause mass effect on the lower trunk and lead to an array of injuries termed Klumpke's palsy, or total claw hand which we'll discuss in a few minutes in quite a bit more detail. The next set of injuries we'll look at are in the level of the end branches, namely the median, radial, and ulnar nerves. As we discuss these, pay close attention to the picture to see what portion of the nerve we're hitting. Namely, is it a proximal portion of the nerve or is it more distal? The proximal portion of the radial nerve is located in the axilla. Can you think of a way that you might compress this nerve? 
Maybe if you have your arm flung over a chair or if you've been using crutches incorrectly, it could cause the nerve to become injured. Moving along the course of the radial nerve, it hugs the humerus in the spiral groove. Injury to the bone from any type of mechanical trauma could also injure the radial nerve due to anatomic proximity. Moving further along the bone, more branches begin to appear, particularly as the nerve passes the elbow. If, for example, the radius is dislocated, the deep branch of the radial nerve may become stretched, causing the extensor muscles of the wrist to lose their innervation. If the extensors lose their innervation, how would this present? As you probably guessed, this would cause a wrist drop. Now, let's turn our attention to the axillary nerve. This nerve comes off the brachial plexus early, posteriorly reaches its sites of innervation. The nerve primarily hugs the surgical neck of the humerus. Therefore, if the humeral neck is fractured, it can injure the axillary nerve. A similar injury would result from dislocation of the humerus. In which direction is the humerus most likely to dislocate? If you said anterior, you're absolutely right. Why? Because there aren't any major tendons or muscles to prevent an anterior subluxation. On the test, this type of injury would manifest in a patient who has difficulty abducting his or her arm after 15 degrees, which is the main function of the deltoid. The musculocutaneous nerve is most often injured due to an upper trunk compression. For example, carrying a heavy backpack. The musculocutaneous nerve innervates the brachioradialis, so what would be the patient's symptoms? They won't be able to flex their arm. Also, there will be a patch of skin on the forearm that is totally numb. The next nerve we're going to look at is the median nerve. Proximal nerve injuries often don't occur until the median nerve approaches the elbow. When it reaches the condyles, it's very vulnerable to compression by a supracondylar fracture of the humerus, more distally and much more commonly. This nerve can be compressed once it enters into the carpal tunnel. Do you recall which bone can compress the median nerve here if it's dislocated? That's right, the lunate bone. This is another good thing to memorize. Even more distally, the recurrent branch of the median nerve moves in the direction of the thumb, and it is very, very superficial. Superficial lacerations of the right area can cause injury to this nerve. Next we're going to look at the ulnar nerve. Proximal injuries of the ulnar nerve can occur with repeated minor trauma to the medial portion of the arm, where the ulnar nerve is still fairly superficial and accessible. This is the so-called bunny bone. Proximal ulnar nerve injuries also occur by fractures of the medial epicondyle. More distally, the ulnar nerve can be lesioned when it is just beyond the wrist, where it can be lesioned by trauma due to, do you remember which bone? That's correct, the hamate, and more specifically, the hook of the hamate. Don't confuse the lunate and the hamate in relation to the median and ulnar nerve injuries. The final nerve that we haven't mentioned to this point is the long thoracic nerve, which originates from root C5 to C7. This nerve innervates the serratus anterior. Why is it important? If you happen to nick it during a mastectomy with lymph node dissection, or you get stabbed, an injury to the long thoracic nerve will cause a wing scapula. What do you think the dysfunction is for these patients? They have marked shoulder instability, which means they have difficulty lifting, pulling, and pushing heavy items. Whew, now we recognize that that was a whirlwind, but remember that I'm going to try and review the high yield parts of that image with subsequent sections. However, I definitely advise coming back to this picture to remember where in the arm the injury often appears. Before we go on to the hands, let's have a flash quiz. What nerve root innervates the skin of only one digit? C7. <laughs> C7. Okay, let's take a quick look at the dermatomes of the hand. You need a bit more detailed knowledge of this area beyond just the nerve roots. On the palm, the skin here is innervated by the ulnar nerve, and here is the median nerve. Have you ever had your pinky finger fall asleep? 
it is probably because you fell asleep studying on your elbow, where the ulnar nerve was compressed. And what about the dorsal side of the hand? Here we see the ulnar, median, and radial nerve all at work innervating skin. The ulnar nerve wraps around to the lateral part of the back of the hand, right here. And the median nerve wraps over the tops of the fingers. Meanwhile, the radial nerve innervates the skin on the medial dorsum. Let's say you're a good medical student, studying hard on a Saturday night, and you fall asleep in your chair. The next morning, you wake up, and you can't extend your hand. And you say to yourself, I have wrist drop. You can't even feel the back of your hand. So what happened? You have Saturday night palsy from falling asleep in your chair. And what nerve did you compress all night? The radial nerve, or the great extensor. It was compressed by the arm of the chair in the spiral groove of the humerus. If you weren't such a great medical student, you might also get this from being too drunk or otherwise intoxicated to get to bed, and hence the name Saturday Night Palsy. Before going on to hand distortions, let's do a flash quiz. What nerve innervates the highlighted skin? The radial nerve. 